Great. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we're joined by author Kate Winkler Dawson for a presentation on her new book, American Sherlock, Murder Forensics and the Birth of American CSI. Uh, the, a little bit about the book, uh, the riveting story of the birth of criminal investigation in the 20th century. Based on years of research and thousands of never before published primary source materials, American Sherlock captures the life of Edmund uh, let me try that again. Edward Oscar Heinrich, the man who pioneered the forensic science that our legal system now relies upon. Uh, known as the American Sherlock Holmes, uh, Edward was one of America's greatest and first forensic scientists with an uncanny knack for finding clues, establishing evidence, and deducing answers with a skill that seemed almost supernatural. Uh, Edward was an investigator who would go on to crack at least 2,000 cases in his 40-year career. Uh, now a little bit about Kate. Uh, Kate is a seasoned documentary producer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, ABC News Radio, PBS NewsHour, and uh, Nightline. Uh, in addition to American Sherlock, Murder Forensics and the Birth of American CSI, uh, Kate is the author of Death in the Air, the True Story of a Serial Killer, The Great London Smog, and The Strangling of a City. And she uh, teaches journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so all of us here live, uh, hook, em, hook em horns, I think that's what they say. I have an that's uncle it. that, that uh, you may know who works uh, at UT as well. Um, so let's give a big virtual round of applause to Kate for joining us here tonight. And Kate, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. And I really appreciate being asked to be here. Um, so I went to, just for a little more background on me, I'm not, I'm not local, definitely, but I went to Boston University for my undergrad degree. And I'm going to be in Lexington in a month to do some research on my fourth book. Uh, and I'll be in Fall River, and I love Massachusetts and everything New England, so I'm very excited. So you guys have to promise that the leaves will be there when I'm there. It's specifically October 12th through the 15th, so I hope that they're there and they haven't fallen yet, uh, but I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be here because uh, this book is really important to me for several different reasons. Uh, first, let me tell you sort of about the trajectory of my career. As Robert mentioned, you know, I was a documentary filmmaker. Really, my background is rooted in television news journalism. So I grew up in Austin, Texas, uh, but I was the product of a psychologist, a clinical psychologist mother, and a law professor father who was an expert in criminal defense and in junk science. So between the two of them, um, I certainly, you know, grew up talking an awful lot about the criminal mind and about law enforcement and junk science and how people become convicted and what might be right or wrong about the criminal justice system. So when I went into television, I did not think I was going to be doing anything that specialized in crime. Uh, and, but I just kept kind of getting drawn into it. I was at CBS in New York. I was at ABC Radio. I was at Fox News Channel. I was kind of all over the place. And, um, you know, I really came back to these really compelling stories that for me usually centered on a crime, but I love historical crimes. So crimes for me are an excellent way to set up a narrative. So when I talk to my students at UT about making documentary films, I've read about this for years, you have the narrative arc, right? So you start at the bottom um, of a story and you tell people why they should care about the story. And then as the story goes on, you become more and more invested in Harry Potter. Why do we care about Harry Potter? Because he was an orphan, because he was really abused by his foster family because, you know, he is an awkward kid. And then when you get to the climax of Harry Potter and, and how he fights, um, you know, the bad people, and then what ends up happening is the fallout. For me, crime has been uh, a, a fairly easy narrative to work with because someone always changes at the end of the story. There's usually dramatic characters 
Um, there's uh, many times we can find, I can find crimes that are really interesting in, the, in a particular part of history that I want to explore. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so when I was thinking about what would be next for my career, my father died in 2005 and I moved back down to Texas, I was in New York. And I started teaching at the journalism school and I started working with the clinic that he started, which was the Innocence Project. So back in it, again, talking a lot about forensics. And uh, I decided once I had children that making documentary films was not gonna work. I love teaching. I've taught at UT since 2006, but I like to have other projects. I like to do other things in addition to teaching. And so I had to give up doing documentary films because I just couldn't get on an airplane anytime and, and go shoot interviews. So a friend of mine who's a really good author named Bill Minataglio said, why don't you consider writing books? And I said, well, you know, I, I've been, spent my entire career writing sentences in broadcast news that are less than seven words. And now how, how do I transition from very short, concise, active writing to longer form, which I had never even done a magazine piece before. And he said, I think you could do it. You just have to find the right book. So I had not acknowledged my love of crime and my interest in crime and, and exploring the criminal justice system. I signed up with an agent just based on being a journalist and having the reputation of being a pretty decent journalist. Um, he said, okay, well, I want you to come up with a really good book idea. And he was really into the military. And I love the Civil War and the American Revolutionary War. So I put together a couple of different proposals and they fell flat. Actually, I think I wrote four proposals. And in narrative nonfiction, a proposal is about 50 pages. So I wrote essentially an entire book's worth of book proposals that were never sold. So um, I one day was thinking, okay, what's my next book gonna be? And a friend of mine said, you know, you are constantly sort of trying to put these book proposals together and then you exhaust yourself. And then what do you go do? And I said, usually I go and watch 48 hour mysteries, Dateline NBC mysteries, uh, you know, like a, a true crime show. And she said, why don't you write about crime? And that all clicked for me because writing books would allow me to wake up at two in the morning and write all night while I had my two kids who were asleep. Um, I could work independently. I didn't have to hire editors. I didn't have to buy equipment like in documentary films. And, you know, it was a way for me to just really be able to ground myself um, in journalism and take my time with it. So ultimately I came up with my first book. So the first book will lead to American Sherlock fairly quickly. The first book is called Death in the Air. And it's about one very large event. And I tell the story of a lot of people within that large event. And American Sherlock is the opposite. American Sherlock is a lot of little events or a lot of cases told through the lens of one person. So I did that pretty deliberately. The first book, Death in the Air, was about uh, the Great London Smog of 1952, which if you are over the age of 50 and a woman, you might have seen it in The Crown, like many people have. It was told completely and accurately in The Crown, but that's okay. I'm sure I'll hear comments about that. <laughs> it was not accurate at all. Uh, it was not as exciting. But in the book, it's a, it's a narrative nonfiction book. It's nonfiction, so everything's true. In the book, there's the smog, and it is one killer, but within the smog is trapped multiple people, a little girl, um, a doctor, a politician, a police officer, and a serial killer, all trapped in this fog. And so with the second book, I really wanted to, like I said, I wanted to do the opposite. I wanted to find specifically a forensic scientist um, who I thought could give me a really professional view of how to tackle a case. And because I love old, old stories, this was not going to be a forensic scientist from 15 years ago. I knew it would be from the beginning of forensics. So how do I find somebody like that? Um, I have a book, but I'm not gonna, I'll show it to you because none of you are gonna wanna buy it. So this is where I believe most of my books are gonna come from in the future. 
It's called, I'll show you guys. Can you see it? It's called Blood Letters and Bad Men. <laughs> it was published in the 1970s. And it is a anthology of every single criminal in American history, starting with the Mayflower. And, and it ends in the 70s, which is perfect for me because I don't really have an interest in crime that's more contemporary than the 70s. I don't actually like the 70s very much. American Church or uh, uh, Death in the Air, which was in 1952, is about as modern as I'm interested in getting. I like really 1800s and 1700s. So um, in this book, I started flipping through and I was looking for whoever this person was, this magical person who I was going to write about for the second book. And I flipped through, I flipped through, and I got through the 1800 Poisoners. I got through the early gangsters in the 1920s and 1930s and 40s. And then I, right in the middle, there is this train heist. And it's called the Siskiyou train robbery. And it's been nicknamed the greatest train robbery, the last, America's last great train robbery, which is, um, if anybody's read the book, you know that that is inaccurate because they actually didn't end up stealing anything. Uh, they blew up half the train and got away with nothing. So I read in this because there's this dramatic picture and I'll show you guys the picture now. Robert was kind enough to give me um, access. So let me share you, let me share first. This is, this is Oscar Heinrich. This is the David Lamson case. If anybody has read the book, he is on the ground testing for blood. Um, and David Lamson, it begins and ends this book. He's the man who worked for Stanford University Press, whose wife was found dead in the bathroom and there's blood splashed on every wall. So Heinrich is, uh, his name is Edward Oscar Heinrich, but he went by Oscar Heinrich. Uh, Oscar's, you know, on the ground testing for blood. So when I first heard about him, it was for this story, which is the Siskiyou train robbery. So in 1923, three brothers decide it's a great idea to rob a train that is coming from Oregon down to California. And they know that this train is going to stop in a tunnel and they can, it has to pause and break and, and um, you know, it just takes this long kind of stop. So they get dynamite and they are ready when this train stops and they get on the train and it's a big nightmare. They don't know how to use dynamite and they blow up really the only part of the train that they wanted to not blow up, which was the U.S. postal car that had all of the money and what they thought was gold in it. In the process, you know, they killed the U.S. Postal Guard who was there and then they end up killing three other people. And it's a big disaster. They run off. They have absolutely no clue, um, you know, uh, where they're going and what they're doing. They're terrible train robbers and now they're killers, but they left behind all of these clues. And that's why Oscar was in this book. They left behind all these clues, none of which got the authorities anywhere. One was the most important was a pair of overalls and the overalls had um, a mysterious smudge of grease that was on one of the pockets. And the federal agents who came down, this is pre-FBI even. So they sent, US Postal sent agents and the Southern Pacific Railway sent federal agents down to investigate. They did these tests. They determined it was mechanics grease. They arrested the first sleazy mechanic they found and they made them put the overalls on and they kind of fit. But everybody felt very uneasy about it. So they called in Oscar Heinrich, who was uh, in the moniker in the book, America Sherlock Holmes. And that's where I first learned about him. And they hand him the overalls and they say, we can't find anything except this mechanics grease. He spends 24 hours, which was very normal for him in his lab, straight, no sleep, no nothing, but some smoking of his pipe and some coffee. And he comes up with 20 to 30 different physical clues that he pulled off this one pair of overalls, including the fact that this was not mechanics grease. They arrested a mechanic for no good reason and scared him to death. It was the pitch from a fir tree. So Oscar was able to figure out the profile of the person who wore this pair of overalls, which was a lumberjack. Somebody, I mean, I would say calling one of the brothers, any of these brothers, a lumberjack is probably a pretty, um, is a pretty broad term because they were not good lumberjacks. They worked in the lumber industry, but they were kind of tiny and, that's not a very good frame, uh, body frame for somebody who's gonna climb trees. 
but he was right. He found all of the markings of what a lumberjack would do with these pairs of overalls on the overalls. And he was able to create this really accurate profile of whoever the, the, the person was who was wearing them. And he also found a little tiny, tiny, tiny piece of paper that the agents had missed that was folded up and shoved into one of the pockets of the overalls and he steamed it open and it was the receipt of a US postal uh, tag, a package that had been sent. And so eventually they're able to identify who these guys are. So this is the case that put Oscar on the map. Um, and so when I read about that, I thought, Eureka, this guy is amazing. This would be my next book. I really, like I said before, I went from the smog that killed 12,000 people and the serial killer who is stuck in, in his house with his wife for five days, which is pretty bad news for a serial killer. And very, uh, this is you know uh, a lot about policy. This is a lot about government corruption. I wanted to do something a lot more personal. Um, and I really wanted to trace forensics, how it's developed from the beginning. So, the next stage that I go through when I'm looking for a book idea is, um, you know, I find out, okay, well, what, what materials am I working with? Because an archive for me is the most important thing. I need letters, I need memos, I need diaries, I need journals to be able to bring these people alive. So you see the pair of glasses that he's wearing? I touched those glasses. They're in his archive. You can't touch the glasses because they're now completely protected and nobody's able to touch them. But when I asked Berkeley to open up his archive, they said, no, it's a hundred boxes. He died, his son held on to the boxes. I think they just locked up his lab and threw away the key and that was it. Because he died in 53. And Mortimer donated all of the contents of the lab in like 68. So this collection had been sitting at UC Berkeley for more than 50 years and nobody had requested for it to be open. So I had to petition and I had to say, this is why this man was important. He was a pioneer in forensics. He, the, he had a list a mile long of the firsts that he did. He was the first in the United States to use forensic geology to solve a crime. He was the first to use bugs, you know, to, to do time of death in the United States. Um, he invented a device for use of uh, comparing bullets in ballistics. There were a lot of things he did, but I think probably we'll talk about this in a little bit. The most important thing he did, which touches my heart, is that he was a teacher. He was a professor. So when people ask me about the impact that Oscar had over this very long career that he had, yes, he solved some really amazing cases like the Siskiyou train robbery. I mean, he had so many different um, sort of bells and whistles in his tool belt that he was able to use. He was an expert at so many different disciplines of forensics, but he was a really good teacher. He taught the first criminalistic criminology classes in the United States, they were at UC Berkeley. And he taught with a man named August Vollmer, who was sort of America's top cop. He was a, a very well-known police officer who was very innovative. Together, they used the lie detector for the very first time in the United States on one of Oscar's most high-profile cases. It's in the book. Um, the lie detector is worthless, pretty much, except it's great to intimidate people. But as far as a way to detect lies, it's really worthless. Oscar didn't know that. So then we get into the legacy of Oscar Heinrich, which is a mixed bag, I can say. Um, he pioneered some forensics and some tools that are really impressive. So as we talked about ballistics, um, he used, a, he invented a way to take a, a photograph through a dual microscope so that you could photograph two bullets at the same time under the same microscope that nobody had ever done before. And he developed a photo in the courtroom to show the jury. It was a, an, a pretty amazing case. He you know, really uh, developed a lot of tools that we use today. He also helped develop and certainly lent credibility to bad science, unfortunately, because at the beginning of anything, you're going to make mistakes. 
he was one of the first, if not, I would argue the first person to use blood stain pattern analysis. And uh, that is junk science. He pushed fingerprints. So if you guys have read the book, I don't know if you have or not, here's the hardback uh, version, which I'm sure the library has. So I like to do, I, I call them Easter eggs, but I know it's not the correct term. That's what my kids would call them. I like to put little things in each of my books that nobody really picks up on. This is Fatty Arbuckle's handprint. So Fatty Arbuckle is a silent film star who went on trial for manslaughter for um, killing a actress. He was you know, having, in a, having a party with essentially in San Francisco. And Oscar went down to the San Francisco city jail and had him do the handprint. So I got the handprint. Oscar took nonstop photos of everything. And so I just told my editor, let's put the handprint on the cover um, as sort of like a little inside joke for me. Only me pretty much <laughs> understands it. So um, Oscar used uh, fingerprints to completely ruin Fatty Arbuckle's life. There were so many hung jury mistrials because of this stupid evidence. There's a, I'll, I'll find it in the book. I should have pulled it up. There's a photo in the book that shows the photo that Oscar used. Um, and I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to see this or not, but it was, there's a photo right here. Hopefully you can see it. It's two handprints. Oscar used this photo to prove that Fatty Arbuckle was trapping Virginia Rapay in the suite. That was the main thing. He could said he could prove using fingerprints and handprints that there was a struggle. That is number one, not the case. And number two, that is such a bad sample of a fingerprint that it would get thrown out at any court now. So they believed him, juries believed it, you know, that fingerprint evidence was going to be that accurate in the 1920s. So he made a lot of mistakes. And I think one of the things that's most interesting about him is he had, I think about 3000 letters in his collection. I read about half of them. And then the people who he wrote were all pretty well-known people. They kept his letters. So he kept their letters, they kept his letters. And so I was able to create conversations that really happened based on these letters. He has, um, his best friend was a guy named John Boynton Kaiser, who was a reference librarian, who turned out to be a really big deal in the world of reference libraries. I had no idea, Robert probably does, but I did not know this was a huge deal. He has a, a, like five collections across the United States. He kept all of Oscar's letters to him. And Oscar shared a lot of, pretty big insecurities with, with uh, Kaiser. They were very close. And Kaiser sent him books. He was a little bit of his Watson to uh, Heinrich's Sherlock Holmes. And then August Vollmer, who I mentioned, the top cop, had his own collection at UC Berkeley because he taught at UC Berkeley also. Oscar's eldest son, Theodore, was a really big deal in the museum world. He was one of the monument men who went in, I think George Clooney made it into a movie, who went in after World War II and authenticated art that had been stolen by the Nazis. So Theodore had a collection at a university in Canada. And so I have all of these letters. In all of these letters, Oscar talks about a lot of his cases. Not once does he express any tiny bit of doubt about decisions that he's made, men he has sent to the gallows to die, cases that he closed, that maybe there was some room for doubt. Not once does he express any kind of doubt anywhere. And I have learned that that's a problem. That's a problem for forensic scientists, anybody who's an expert witness, it's a problem to not doubt yourself sometimes to not want to improve your techniques. And because he worked at the beginning of forensics, I think they thought all of these guys, Goddard, all of these really well-known forensic scientists who were experts, I think they just thought everything they did was right. And this is not accounting, this is people's lives. He sent, Oscar sent six men to the gallows in one year. And I have no idea whether it was based on good evidence or bad evidence. But I walked away from this book realizing how much bad 
forensic evidence we do have and how much bad, how many bad techniques we use. And at the end of the book, you know, I have a hope of how we solve that, like really supporting national organizations that we hope to, we could create like national certifications or unified training. If Robert and I are both fingerprint experts and he's in Massachusetts and I'm in Texas, we've been trained by completely different people. His opinion can cancel out my opinion. And then if you're on a jury, who are you going to believe? We're both wearing white jackets. So that's another thing that happens in the book. We go behind the scenes in a jury room in the David Lamson case, the man who was accused of killing his wife. There is a jury, it is very contentious, and a woman is, uh, I mean, essentially abused until she finally relents and convicts him of murder. And this is something that happens in juries now. So this book was very eye-opening for me, um, particularly towards forensics, but just the, just the legal system in general. Um, so once I decided that this would be the book I wanted to write, I had to wrangle all of this information. People are always sort of interested in how I can narrow down 2000 cases. And the answer is you can't, I can't. I had to say to the archivist who I became really good friends with, thankfully. I said to the archivist, um, tell me, well, first of all, she said, thank goodness. She said, I have already pulled out the most violent cases because I'm assuming that's what you're most interested in. And I said, you assume correctly. I am interested in the most violent cases. And she said, so once we pull out those violent cases, how do we, I think it was like 500 of them. And she said, how do you want to narrow it down after that? And I said, well, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but I said, which one are your biggest files? Because that's the most material I would have. Oscar kept all of his trial transcripts, sometimes only like what he would do, um, only his part when he was on the witness stand. But a lot of these trials are not available online. I can't buy the transcripts anywhere. They just aren't around. And so uh, we picked out the cases that I thought would work. And then I had to go back to this narrative arc, right, that I talked about earlier, where you start at the beginning. Why do I care about Harry Potter? Well, because I feel sorry for him because he seems really sweet because I hope the best for him because he's really had a hard life. And then you build towards, you know, his relationships with other people and the climax, the big fight with evil. And then what's the fallout? How has he changed? I had to do that with this man, not only with Oscar Heinrich in his life, right? He was born in poverty. Um, his father died really tragically and affected his, his, the rest of his life. He, to me, very clearly has obsessive compulsive personality disorder, for sure, based on the archive. He had, and we could talk a little bit about this, he had, when I walked in, I think there were probably 30 leather bound, huge, journals, like logs, for basically, I would say, 50 of his 70 years, he had logged every penny he spent of every single day. And I mean, like five cents for butter, 45 cents for petrol, whatever, whatever he was spending money on, he chronicled it. And then he journaled all the time. And he even journaled when he was journaling, I found an entry that said 8pm journalizing. The amount of energy it must have taken him to do all of this and to try to stay in control was pretty astounding. Um, he was constantly in fear of being of going into bankruptcy, being foreclosed on. And he should have been because he was kind of constantly struggling with it. He didn't know how to manage money really well, even though he made a lot of money. And I think a lot of it comes down to the way he was raised, the way his father died, which was very upsetting. Um, and I think Oscar was just constantly haunted by financial problems. And he worked all the way up until he died when he was in the seventies to support his family, inc including both of his grown sons. So, um, you know, I realized that when I was looking at this narrative arc that I've been talking about, that I needed a lot of them. I needed the narrative arc for Oscar's life 
right? His beginnings, how he learns to be a forensic scientist. He's got some wins. He's got a huge humiliation and a really, really big case. And then as he comes down, what's his legacy? He's a very successful professor and a very successful forensic scientist, but he always wanted a little bit more. He wanted to be a fiction writer, but he was a terrible fiction writer, I think. Um, and so, you know, like, what is this man's legacy? But within each of those cases, well, within this whole story, we've got all of these cases. There's a chemistry, a, a chemist who blows himself up and Oscar has to figure out what happened. There is um, a woman named Bessie Ferguson. I'll show you the, uh, hopefully you guys can see this. He's working with her bones right there. So in the case of Bessie Ferguson, he was sent in the mail by the, to the police, from the police, uh, an ear with a scalp attached and they had no other body parts. And they said, where is the rest of her? Help us find her. And it was deposited in a boggy marsh with no sand. And he found a grain of sand in her ear. He took a geological map and he figured out where that sand likely came from. It was 12 miles away from where her ear and scalp were. And that's where they found the rest of her body. I don't think there's any way they would have found the body had he not figured that out. And he used a technique that he learned as a sanitary engineer who was working with roads and highways. He used a special microscope that had a prism that when you put a grain of sand underneath, it sort of breaks it apart and tells you what the components are. And then he could use the geological map to figure out what sand in the area. I did not know that sand had different components and they had salt deposits. He knew that there was such a small amount of salt deposit on the sand that it wasn't sand that you would find on the beach, like Port Aransas, where I am. It was sand that came off of a river that was attached to a beach or an ocean. So, you know, all of this is to say that with each of these cases, there's a mini narrative arc. There's Bessie Ferguson. What do we know about this woman, you know, who was found with body parts all over the place? Well, we know a lot about her. She was extorting men for money. Um, for pregnancies that were not real. So you have a long list of suspects. Now he has to figure out who killed her. So there's a narrative arc through the whole book of Oscar's life. There's a narrative arc of the tools that he used. How have they been improved? How have, you know, um, where have we, where did we come from with handwriting analysis? Where are we now? And how did he contribute to that? Then I have to keep an eye on his life, his marriage, his two sons. He let them basically do whatever they wanted and you know, put him into major debt. He sent his sons to travel in the Caribbean when they were older. And I mean, really he spoiled them. And so I have to keep an eye on all of this stuff. So you don't lose sight of who he is, but you don't also lose sight of the forensics and where we were and where, and where we are. So it was a challenging book for all of those reasons to wrangle um, because these cases were complicated. There's the case of Fatty Arbuckle I mentioned who went on trial for manslaughter for killing Virginia Rapay, who was an actress at a party that he was at uh, in, during prohibition. Um, there's the case of a missing Catholic priest and the man who eventually becomes convicted and how that happens. Um, there is, uh, I mentioned the, the I, I call it the calculating chemist story. Bessie Ferguson, I think this one here is one of the most interesting. David Lamson, this is Oscar um, with his assistant who is the gentleman standing above him, his uh, other assistant who is sort of the secretarial work for him and then the uh, male assistant's wife looking very curious at the back. Uh, and he's at David Lamson's house looking at the blood and trying to figure out what kind of blood it is. So all of this is a complicated, it was a complicated book to write because Oscar Heinrich was a really complicated man. Thank goodness he kept everything. I joke he's a productive hoarder. He kept everything and that's why this archive was huge. And that's why it wasn't opened for more than 60 years, 50 years, 60 years, because it was so big that UC Berkeley just said, we don't have the bandwidth to do this. But I said, 
this is someone who shifted the conversation about forensics. The whole trajectory of forensics is just this one person, right? There are other people who contributed to it, but Oscar was a generalist. He knew, and he was an expert on all of this. And I said this, you know, he's, he needs to have this book written about him. And so they opened it up and it took a long time for them to catalog everything. But he was a really extraordinary person with a lot of gifts. He also had a lot of flaws, which, you know, who doesn't? And I appreciate that. So I really liked finding the flaws and I also liked finding the strengths. Uh, and, and, you know, the most important thing for me with books is a couple of things. One, I love certain eras and you cannot beat the eras where this book takes place. It's from what, 1920 until 1933. So think about what happened. There's prohibition. There's the roaring twenties where everybody had money. And then there were a lot of fraudsters and con artists and then the great depression. So these are great time periods to work in. Like my first book, 1950s London, not so great. It's a pretty depressing time period in London. It's before the, the for, kind of before the Beatles and after the Blitz and it's sort of in a, not a great time period. I really liked working with uh, 1920s Berkeley. So um, it's been quite a trip and, and I'm actually ready to take questions, Robert, if there's any that pop up and I'll stop sharing. Great, well, thank you so, so much, Kate. Uh, we do have a question already. Uh, Teresa, well, oh, well, this probably isn't the best question to start you out with, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in the order that they come in. So Teresa wants to know, what is the book about that you are currently working on? Oh, well, thank you. Um, I have two podcasts that are historical true crime podcasts. One is called Tenfold More Wicked, and the other one is called Wicked Words. Tenfold More Wicked is like a documentary series. It's one historical, old historical case where I interview family members who are alive. I go to the locations of where things happen. We have a lot of like great sound that takes you back to that time period, really creepy soundtrack. Uh, and I say that because the very first season, which is called All That Is Wicked, is about a man named Edward Ruloff, who was a genius in linguistics and brilliant. And he spoke like 12 different languages and this is Gilded Age, upstate New York. And he also was a killer. He killed quite a few people. And when it looked like he was going to be executed, there were people in New York like Mark Twain and Horace Greeley and other really influential people who said, don't kill him. He's far too smart. So this, that book is a lot about the criminal mind. And R Edward Ruloff was the first. He was the first one uh, to really be studied in that way. So think Ted Bundy, not the sexual sadist part, but the brilliant and charming and deceitful and really makes you rethink the way you view criminals and people who kill, except in 1871, not in 1971. So the book is, is based on that podcast. There's a group of men who come in to interview Edward Ruloff and he's shackled to um, a jail cell in Binghamton, New York, awaiting execution for a, yet another murder. And all of these men come in and they're like the 19th century mind hunters. There's a psychologist, there are the alienists, which are the psychiatrists, there are people in religion, there's journalists. They all come in and they're trying to figure out what makes this guy tick, just like they did with Bundy, just like they've done with a lot of other kind of well-known criminals and nobody could figure it out. <laughs> nobody could figure it out, so. So I'm excited, I'm wrapping that up. As soon as I'm done talking to you guys, I have to go back to chapter seven <laughs> and try to wrap it up in the next month or so. Thank you for asking that. So Marty asks, well, Marty says, Oscar is a great character. Have you had anyone interested in putting him in a movie? Uh, P.S. I loved your book. Oh, thank you. Yes, but you can't tell anyone. Uh, yes, it's, it's being made into a Netflix documentary series, so. It'll be sort of a half fictional, half documentary style. So it's really, we're really excited about that. And Death in the Air, about the serial killer stuck, stuck in the smog, was bought by Miramax Television. That's being made into a narrative fictional series, which is going to be much darker than even my book, which is a pretty dark book to begin with. The good question, though. Thank you. 
Well, that's great. Congratulations on that success. And uh, thank you. While you're collaborating with Netflix, you can let them know how uh, poorly The Crown uh, portrayed uh, portrayed that. Uh, um, so, that so, Lin okay. <laughs> uh, Lin so we have a questions from Linda and Diane, and I encourage folks to keep asking questions. We'll go for at least another uh, ten minutes or so. Uh, Linda asks, "Are there any forensic procedures used today that you think are suspect or need to be studied more?" Many, that's a good question. Anything that we call pattern matching is suspect. And an easy way to think about it is, is that forensic tools that are developed within law enforcement and not within the scientific community need to be very closely looked at. And at a minimum should not be relied upon when you convict someone, fingerprint evidence is, is pattern matching. Right, as I said before, when bought with, if Robert and I are trained differently, it's human, it's human analysis. It's up to his analysis and my analysis and to compare, and we might not always agree. Handwriting analysis is a huge one. Um, handwriting, your handwriting can change based on the medication you're on or how tired you are. So that's also something to look at. Footprint, of course, bite mark. That, I mean, that's what's so ironic about forensics. Everybody knew Ted Bundy was guilty. How did they get him? On junk science, on bite mark analysis, which is junk science. You cannot match somebody's bite to an arm. If you're moving your hand, it, it skews. I know that Ted Bundy had bad teeth, but it, it's not good science. And it's almost always now thrown out. Um, let's see. You know, the issue with DNA is that a lot of times now it was developed in the scientific community, obviously, but there are ways to poke holes in DNA. Um, to sh if, if a lab has had any kind of a track record of cross-contamination, a good defense attorney can, can poke a hole in that, especially if the DNA evidence is the main evidence in that case. Things that are, are pretty rock solid, toxicology, DNA is, if the lab has done its due diligence, um, uh, I think uh, uh, bullet, ballistics is usually really strong. Things that are developed outside of the scientific community, though, that haven't been peer reviewed or printed in journals or rigorously tested are all suspect. And that's kind of the issue. There are people in jail in Texas because a dog sniffed them and said, well, you're guilty, you know, so... I think the, the main issue is, is that when we lean too heavily on potentially bad science, and that's the only evidence against somebody, then that is the problem. And that's what happened with Oscar. They would have one piece of really strong evidence. For years, we thought eyewitness testimony was reliable. It's not. For years, we thought that confessions, if, you, if Robert confesses to a murderer, he's guilty. Not true. About a quarter, I think it's about a quarter of wrongful convictions are from false confessions. Innocent people do confess to things that they didn't do. So it's it's interesting. This was very eye-opening. This book went, made me kind of go, oh my gosh, I cannot believe the amount of people who maybe were guilty but shouldn't have been convicted on the evidence that they were convicted on. What else? Yeah, so uh, Mary wants you to uh, list the, the names of your two podcasts again. She, she missed those. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, tenfold. I say ten, but it's ten, tenfold, more wicked, which is a quote from uh, Jekyll and Hyde. It's when, it's when Jekyll is describing how much more evil Hyde is than he. He says tenfold more wicked. And then the other one's called Wicked Words. So if you just go, if you listen to uh, My Favorite Murder, I'm on that network for My Favorite Murder. But if you go to Apple Podcasts and you just put my name in, it'll, it'll pop up. Wicked Words is the podcast that's most active right now. Tenfold More Wicked's on hiatus until January, the documentary style, because they're hard to make. It's like making a four hour documentary. Uh, and I do three of those a year. So when we go on hiatus, Wicked Words takes over and Wicked Words is uh, my interviews with what my favorite true crime journalists. And we just talk about their best, tri best true crime stories. But true crime for me is very like squishy. Like I interviewed, I had a great interview with the guy who wrote what I think is probably the best book ever on the Hatfield McCoy feud. That's true crime. It doesn't, it doesn't fall under our sort of normal definition of true crime, but it's, it's, it was so interesting. And that time period is a great time period. 
Uh, Diane would like to know, in your opinion, what is the most gruesome crime that you wrote about in your book? Um, in American Sherlock, I would say probably Bessie Ferguson was pretty bad. She's the woman who he eventually found the rest of her body or, or he told people where to find them. Bessie, um, the, whoever did it, he, it was unsolved. Whoever did it went to some pretty extreme lengths to cover it up. And she had been dismembered and um, bashed over the head and then dismembered. And of course, we don't have any idea whether or not there was a sexual assault involved, but it was a pretty, it was pretty, dismembering somebody is a, is a really, it's a next level killer to somebody who can actually do that. So uh, I think that was the most disturbing. And I actually have a lot of respect for Oscar. I disagreed with him sometimes on, like he really hated Fatty Arbuckle. He thought all everyone in Hollywood was disgusting and ostentatious and sinners. Oscar thought women should be wearing corsets and, you know, he was very, he was very kind of prissy, I think. And, uh, but with Bessie Ferguson, you know, she was a woman who um, was extorting men who dated a lot of, of different men and Oscar didn't judge her. He just never said one thing about, you know, she was inappropriate. Same thing with Virginia Rapay, who was the showgirl, or she was a, a, an actress who was, who died in Fatty Arbuckle's suite at the St. Francis Hotel. Uh, when she was at a party, she had been drinking and he never said she shouldn't have been there. He never judged her, which was impressive because he certainly judged other women. So, you know, people are you know, mixed bag. I can't control everything that they say or do. Karen would like to know, um, well, she says, Scotland Yard has some history in forensics. Did Heinrich uh, study any of their methods? Uh, also, uh, uh, did he do any profiling? He did. So he worked, Oscar worked with uh, Scotland Yard on several different cases, which was really interesting. There was a bombing at uh, the Statue of Liberty in 19, I think it's 1915, I can't remember. Uh, uh, I think they called it Black Tom Island. I didn't write about it in the book, I mentioned it. And um, he worked with Scotland Lincoln Yard on that case. He collaborated with different forensic scientists in Europe and they would exchange tips and stuff. Um, but he did work on, with Scotland Yard on several things, especially during World War II. You know, my expertise with Oscar really stops at 1933. I have thousands of more letters that extend from 1933 until 1953 when he died that I just can't, I can't, they aren't in the book. So I can't get through all of those letters, but I know that he spent a lot of time in Europe working with Scotland Yard, particularly during the war. Um, and he was uh, likened himself to being a pretty good code breaker. So they used him there too, to break some codes. So it was interesting. He just had so many different talents um let me think was the other what was the other part of the question yeah, do you work so, with scotland yard yeah uh was uh, uh, did he engage in any profiling oh yeah one of the first which is amazing so oscar was um he liked to predict who people were and one example you'll read about in the book is the person who kidnapped father heslin who was a priest in colma california and Father Heslin went missing and they received ransom notes that were incredibly odd, half written in handwriting and half typed out. And Oscar looked and, and you know, they were trying to figure out who this man was. And they brought in two handwriting experts who they brought in before Oscar. It was sort of the beginning of his career. He wasn't very well known. So he wasn't even second chair, he was third chair behind these yutzes that came in. And uh, these guys said, this guy, the, based on his handwriting, he looks crazy, which is not very helpful. There are a lot of crazy people in California. And Oscar looked at it and said, listen, I don't know about his sanity or, or, or not, but I know that he's a professional baker and of course the cop said, how would you know that? And he said, if you look at the way that he's done the lettering, that's the way a trained baker does lettering on a cake. 
And he was right. And what's interesting about that statement that I learned a lot from was Oscar, and he explained this later, he said essentially that if you are a professional baker and you decide to become a criminal, you are still a professional baker. You can't break out of those habits. So that's what people really rely on. And what happened with the Siskiyou train robbery also is, you know, these guys were wearing overalls. This, this one, one of the brothers was wearing an overall, a pair of overalls. And he had the pitch from a fir tree on the pocket. He had pine needles, a really specific type of tree that Oscar knew exactly where it was in his pocket. He had fingernail clippings in his pocket. So Oscar said, I can predict, I know how tall this guy is, how much he weighs based on the shoulder straps. Um, you know, I think what's difficult about profiling that they figured out in the 70s is sometimes it's a little bit of a, I'm not sure how helpful it really is, you know, um, but, but it was helpful in that he was able to make some confirmations, particularly with the Baker story where, you know, uh, the Hightower, who was William Hightower, who was eventually convicted, was a baker, and they were able to use part of that evidence to connect him to the handwriting because Oscar knew handwriting was not always going to be, you know, um, helpful. They did something in the 1920s. I don't think they still really do. It's called graphology. So it was the belief that your personality comes out in your handwriting. So it's not like um, Robert, you know, I can, I can match Robert's check, you know, a signature on his check to a signature on the deed of his house. It's more like I can look at Robert's, the way that he signed his check and figure out whether he's, you know, um, a bad lover or frustrated in life or uh, has depression based on whether he closes up the O on one of his letters. I mean, it's crazy. So Oscar, Oscar really um, was trying to lean more on the habits, and that, as he said, a, you know, a killer, a, a baker, a baker who becomes a killer is still a baker, and so he doesn't even realize that handwriting will be a clue. I could make a joke or two right now, Kate, but I'm going to move on. Um, so uh, let's see here. A lot of good questions. How about Teresa? Uh, how long does it take you to do all your research and then write the book? And uh, how do you know when to stop researching? Oh, gosh. Sounds like Teresa might be a writer. I'm not sure. It takes forever for me. I have a hard time answering that question, Teresa, honestly, because I have a lot of crossover. So when I get frustrated with one book, I start looking for the next book and then the research on that next book begins. So it's always really hard for me to untangle where one stops and the other one starts. And on top of that, it's not when you stop writing for me, it's when it, it's, uh, it's not when you start research, stop researching, it's when you stop writing. So, you know, like the section that I'm writing right now about Edward Ruloff, um, you know, we're getting to a point where he's getting ready to potentially be executed. And there's a, a phrenologist, which is sort of the 19th century psychologist, it's bunk, but a phrenologist comes in um, to analyze him. And so I haven't done research on contemporary psychology right now um, with what we do with serial killers now. I have to dig into that tomorrow. So I leave a lot of blanks as I go along when I get to these chapters and I realize, oh, I need to fill in this here or I need to go back. I did that with um, Death in the Air an awful lot. I like to start out with scene setting, I call it. So, um, you know, for instance, one of the scenes in Death in the Air, I start with these women, they, these women they called fluffers in the 1950s who were hired to go down into the underground, the subway system with wire brushes and clean all of the soot, horrible job off the inside of the tunnels. And so I start with a scene that I just on the fly when I was writing the book, I just thought, oh, I, I really wanna start out with some kind of a dramatic scene. And I just found a picture of, of the fluffers on Getty images. And so I just did a little research there and wrote about it. And sometimes you go down a, a, a big hole and sometimes you don't. For research, 
for me to know when to stop, a lot of times for me, it's when I realize that I know exactly where I've read something. And what's even more alarming is when I realize that one source that I'm using is plagiarizing the other source. Then I kind of go, okay, well, if I can recognize where these sentences are coming from, then maybe it's time to stop and start writing my own stuff. I, I'm friends with uh, Bill Brands, who is a, a really HW Brands, who's a great history writer. And he always told me, just start writing as soon as possible. He said, I do some research, but then go ahead and just get into it. Cause I think he probably knows that you can just get into a hole you never get out of. So Kate, we're coming up on eight o'clock my time, seven o'clock your time. So let me uh, see if I can combine a question here. Uh, okay. Rachel, Rachel asks, do you have any TV true crime recommendations? And Diane asks, do you have difficulty suspending disbelief when you watch crime show forensics? I do. That's a really good question. Robert was actually just telling me before this started that they're bringing CSI back, which I didn't even realize. I, yes, when I work for the Innocence Project and we wait for more than a year for DNA results to come back and on CSI they come back in 12 minutes, it's a little hard to believe. <laughs> I think it's really frustrating. Um, and you know, you also have to think like every jurisdiction has different, has a, a different sources. So um, I, I think it, it is hard sometimes to see what happens on crime shows. I, I really do prefer, uh, as far as, as far as forensics goes, I like sticking with sort of the real deal. I, what do I think, what are the things that I've really enjoyed? Um, I watch a lot of Netflix, true crime stuff. I liked, I don't know if you, oh, so I'll list off three or four things that I like, but none of them might be your cup of tea. I enjoyed um, Sophie, which was about the murders in West Cork. And I love the podcast. A friend of mine made the podcast, which was about a French woman who um, lived in a house in, uh, in Ireland, in very remote island, Ireland, and she was murdered. And there's a lot of twists and turns in that story. And I think it's beautifully done. True crime has the ability to really make you feel icky. Some of it does. And I, my goal is to never make somebody feel icky, um, to never exploit things. For instance, I'm really uncomfortable writing about sexual assaults. Um, but it's part of doing this. So in my first book, Death in the Air, he is a rapist and a serial killer. But when I write about what happens, I really, really leave, it's pretty obvious what happens. And I try to have the, while using the facts, have the women, if they're the victims, be as strong characters as the serial killer, which is not easy because there's something very captivating about serial killers and interesting. But I think it's really gross when we pine over them. So, um, you know, I, I describe what she must have felt like to, to have this pantyhose tied around her neck. And then that's it. And, and that's it. We know what happens after that. So um, it's a big challenge for me honestly, to sort of figure out the best way to write these stories. And I think, I can't remember, what was the first, Robert, what was the first part of the question that was really good too? Uh, so yeah, so, sometimes when I combine questions, I, it's kind of a fail on my part. No, so no, I no, it's okay. Uh, Ra Rachel, at, Rachel, who by the way, um, uh, is, a, is a fellow librarian, uh, asks, do you have any TV true crime recommendations? Yeah. So Sophie, I think Sophie, which is uh, this from, I think it's called Sophie Tragedy maybe in West Cork, I think is really interesting. Um, I really like, uh, what else did I watch? I've watched a couple of things re recently. I mean, the Ted Bundy tapes, he's so gross, but it's fascinating to hear him talk. Uh, I think that's really interesting. The I recommend The Ripper, which is the Yorkshire Ripper. And I like that because the filmmakers really emphasize, this is a guy who killed 13 people in England in the eighties, I think. I like it because the, the um, filmmakers really emphasize the way that he was able to get away with this for so long, because much like the serial killer in my book, John Reginald Christie, 
the guy who was a Yorkshire Ripper targeted women who were sex workers or part-time sex workers and, and, and some that weren't, but they were all categorized in the same way. They were all sort of compartmentalized. And if you were attacked and you weren't a sex worker, they didn't believe you. And then you, you know, they've left all of these opportunities. It's a really crazy story. Um, I think that's really interesting. I'm completely grossed out, but interested in what's his name? Neil Nielsen. It just came out the Nielsen tapes. He was a Scottish serial killer who killed a bunch of men. He was in London and they have his tapes. And I'm conflicted about that story because, you know, it gives him quite a big voice, but there's a lot of that story that's on Netflix also is really interesting because his mother sounds so surprised. She said, I don't understand why people didn't pick up on this. I think if he lived at home, he was a nice boy. There was nothing extraordinary about him. If he had lived at home, we would have picked up on it. And then, you know, they cut to an interview with him saying, I was really troubled as a kid. I had a, I just, nobody understood. They couldn't see. So I, that, that, comparison between a family's reality and the person who's committing the crime, I always find really interesting. And then I've watched some really weird films that I would say are not necessarily true crime. One is called The Woman Who Wasn't There. I don't know if you guys saw that. It's a woman who said that her husband was killed on September 11th and she was in the other tower and he was in one of the towers and she wasn't there. She had become this huge victim rights advocate in New York and she, she was in Spain at the time. And then another one is, um, that's actually even more interesting is, um, what is the woman's name? Something, the wolf and something, Magda, I can't remember, it's on, it's on uh, uh, Netflix, look up The Wolf. It's a, about a woman who had claimed that she had escaped from the Nazis and kind of had been raised by wolves and the story totally fell apart and kind of what her reality was and, and deception. I've become really interested in fraudsters because of Edward Ruloff, because of the podcast and because of this book. I'm really interested in deceivers and charlatans and stuff. So I was, I, that's, those two stories are not normally my cup of tea, but I am, I am interested in the way those are put together. So that's, those are my recommendations, just a few of my recommendations. <laughs> There you go. That was a good question. You had, you had a good response there. Yeah. Um, so I, I do want to be respectful of uh, Kate's time. I also don't want to ask the bug question because uh, I haven't eaten my dinner yet. So we're going to skip that <laughs> question. Let's do one more kind of kind of random, but uh, it, it was notable. Uh, Diane says that you uh, did not mention his wife during your presentation. Was yeah. she ever involved or interested in his work? And what was she like? Marion seemed like a lovely woman and probably a pretty good partner for him, but they never talked about cases in their letters. And I seriously doubt in person they talked about cases. I think he really liked to compartmentalize his professional life from his personal life. Um, you know, Oscar becomes a, in some ways to me, a very stereotypical 1920s man who he says, it's his pleasure to keep financial problems away from his wife. So he lies to her an awful lot. She has no clue how uh, deeply in debt they are. And um, at least he doesn't think she has a clue. She seems like a great mom and a good provider and, a, and probably a good partner, but he was much more close, emotionally close, I think, and, and much, much more vulnerable with John Boyd and Kaiser than he ever was with Marion. I am guessing in person, but certainly in letters. The letters between he and Marion were sort of like a little bit of gossip on her part, catching up on the boys and what's happening with his two kids. And, and you know, he, he just sort of said, I'm traveling here, I'm traveling there. And he'll mention a case, but really it was, I mean, I'm sure they, they had been together for a very long time. I think they were married about 50 years when he died, maybe more. But um, she was not like a confidant in that way for him, I don't think. Excellent. 
Well, I think Wait, we'll so you it. don't want to mean what bug question? I can't do a bug. You don't want to talk about a bug uh, we can. OK, it we'll end it with the bug question. It's more of a general question. But Mike says, what was Oscar's interest in bugs and what cases were bugs important to? OK, so the forensic, um, what is it, entomology? So it's the secession that bugs arrive to a corpse in a certain way. Blowflies are first. So Oscar, with the case of Bessie Ferguson, he looked, remember the skull, uh, the skull in the ear um, piece, uh, the scalp in the ear. He looked on the outside of the ear and there were either blowflies or blowfly eggs only. So no beetles. So it goes blowflies and then beetles come to a corpse next. So if there were only blood blowflies, that meant she had been dead only 24, or at least the ear had been deposited 24 to 48 hours earlier. I don't remember what the rest of the wave is, but it's like blowflies and then beetles and then another kind of fly. And I can't remember the order, but but it's still used today to give a guesstimation of, of how long the corpse has been there. It's, fa it's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And nobody had used it in the United States before. This was the case, especially because it helped him figure out how fresh the body was, you know? So, uh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. That doesn't phase uh, me, but. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. It's, it's interesting, it's interesting. Um, it's funny, you can talk about the dead bodies and I don't blink, but when you talk about the bugs, I get a little grossed out. Yeah. Um, so uh, folks, let's give Kate a big virtual round of applause Thank you. For, uh, for a wonderful uh, 60 minute presentation and then some. Kate, do you have any last minute, uh, last words uh, to the group uh, before we wrap up? No, keep reading. What a great group and please support this library system. And I, you know, I mean, Robert had mentioned that I was doing this pro bono and I just, I, it would never even occur to me to charge a library. I actually really don't charge fees for anybody, but I would never charge a library for a fee because I think we just have to continue to support them and certainly take the survey and, you know, continue to support these folks in the time that we're having right now, my goodness. I mean, if anything we need, we need libraries and books to keep us sane. So thank you for supporting me and for coming to this. I really appreciate it. Wonderful, wonderful. And thank you, Kate. And uh, we appreciate your generosity. And I wanna thank uh, Andover, Bill Ricca, mm -hmm. Tewksbury and Wilmington for, for partnering and, and helping us promote this event. And I wanna um, you know, thank all of you for joining us. And as uh, Kate said, uh, please uh, fill out uh, that feedback form when you get it tomorrow. And also uh, feel free to share the recording with anyone in your life who you feel might be interested in this presentation. So thanks again, Kate. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thank thanks you. Ho good hook them horns, Kate, hook them horns. That's right, All hook them. Right. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye. Bye, -bye. thanks.